Hey guys, it's Miss Johnson, and I'm here to bring you our first notes for chapter 10. This is the first half of section 10.1. We are flipping back to confidence intervals in this chapter, and this time we are doing confidence intervals of means. Back in chapter 8, we did confidence intervals for um, proportions. Now we're going to do confidence intervals for means. The good news is our framework of answering a question is going to stay the same. We're going to look at state, plan, do, conclude. Um, there's just some slight differences, which is why this is something that has its own chapter and why we talk about it separate. So there's some subtle differences, but for the most part, it's stuff that you've been doing now for two chapters, and it should feel pretty familiar once we actually dig in to finding some of these intervals. So here's our first um, slight difference. The slight difference here is if we are estimating a population mean, that means we don't know the population mean. If we don't know the population mean, then it's not possible for us to know the population standard deviation. Okay, so here's where that becomes maybe a slight problem. We use the population standard deviation in our Z statistic. We would use that for proportions, when we did proportions, this was our standard deviation piece where we had the square root of P hat times one minus P hat divided by N. Now, for a confidence interval for a population mean, our, our standard, our test statistic would look like this. We'd have the sample mean, we'd have the Z star value, which you find the Z star value the same way you did in proportions, so that's good. But then we'd have this for our standard deviation. We would take the standard deviation divided by the square root of N for our sample size. Okay, but here's the problem. Unfortunately, we don't know the true value of the mean. That means that we don't know the true value of the standard deviation. So here's how life gets different. Since we don't know the true value of the standard deviation, we has, have to use S of X, which is our sample standard deviation. So instead of using sigma, because we don't have sigma, we're going to use S of X, which is our sample standard deviation. And that sample standard deviation comes from um, a sampling distribution. When we take a sampling distribution, we can find the sample standard deviation of that sampling distribution. But here's the problem with that. When we switch from using our population standard deviation to using the sampling, the sampling distribution standard deviation, now our confidence intervals are not necessarily as accurate as they once were. So we used a 99%, this is just an example here to show you kind of what we're talking about. We use a 99% confidence interval, but only 92.5% of our thousand intervals actually captured the, two, the true mean. To achieve 99% capture rate, we need to multiply by a larger critical value. So basically, our intervals are going to widen here a little bit, okay? They are going to naturally have to widen to capture the true mean. And to make them naturally widen, we're no longer going to be using a Z test. Instead, we're going to be using a T test. We are going to be doing a T test. So to estimate mean when the standard deviation is unknown, we are going to use a T star critical value instead of a Z star critical value. So the critical value T star has the same interpretation as Z star. It measures how many standard deviations we need to extend from the point estimate to get the desired level of confidence. We specify a particular T distribution by giving its degrees of freedom. So... This little piece right here, this degrees of freedom is going to be our added component of um, our um, testing for or our finding the confidence interval for mean. It says T distributions have more area in the tails than standard normal distribution, which is what therefore makes our interval a little bit wider. Okay, so you can see the the red dashed line of the T star. It doesn't come. It doesn't peak quite as high in the middle, and it fans out a little bit more on each tail. Okay, it's up a little bit higher than the other ones. So this degrees of freedom is what we're going to talk about and where you find that degrees of freedom. It's not a hard thing to find, I promise. Um, and just know that that's what we have to do in order to widen that interval because the Z star doesn't give us enough when we have an unknown standard deviation.
Okay, so here's your test. Here's your test statistic. Instead of the old one was p hat plus or minus z star and then the whole p hat times, or sorry, p times one minus p, p times one minus p all over the square root of n. Um, that was for proportions. So this should hopefully look kind of familiar. We're doing a similar thing, except we're using the mean. We have to use a T star with a certain number of degrees of freedom. And we have to take our standard deviation with the sampling standard deviation because sigma is unknown. We don't know what sigma is. Divided by the square root of n, that comes from our sampling distribution standard deviation. Um, and here's how you get to the degrees of freedom. So T star is a critical value from a T distribution with N minus one degrees of freedom, okay? N minus one degrees of freedom. And then we still use the C percent confidence. So if our confidence level is 90%, we're gonna go to 90% to the N minus one degrees of freedom, okay? This is called a one sample T interval for means. Whereas this one down here was a one sample z interval interval for proportions okay this is all chapter eight um now we're looking at one sample t interval for means okay so that's how life becomes a little bit different. So that degrees of freedom is kind of a new component to us, but all you do is take n minus one. So if your n was 30, your degrees of freedom is 29. If your n is 100, your degrees of freedom are 99. That's all you do, n minus one. Okay, so now let's talk about how we actually find that T star value. Because when we were looking for the Z star value, we would use inverse norm to calculate what our Z star is. But in this case, we are looking at something a little bit different. It's a different distribution. It's not our normal curve. So there's a couple of ways you can do that. The first way is to look at table B. Now, table B in your textbook is um, page T3. It's way back in the back of your textbook. Um, it's right after the normal distribution chart. So you'll see the two pages of the normal distribution chart. You know, you've got one page for the negative values and one page for the positive values. The next chart over is the T star value chart. And if you look at that chart on page T3, go ahead and grab your textbook and flip to it right now. You can see that all across the top, you've got um, tail probability. And then all across the side, you've got the degrees, or all down the side, I should say, you've got the degrees of freedom. So let's talk about what that tail probability would be here. So in part A, in part A, I'm looking at a 95% confidence interval um, based on an SRS of size n equals 12. So if I draw out my normal curve here, I've got a normal curve, here's my 95% in the middle. My 95% in the middle means that I have 5% on the outside, okay? So that 5% is split between my two tails. So that means each tail is 2.5%, okay? 2.5%, or in other words, my tail probability is 0.025. So that's where you get your tail probability. Your tail probability comes from taking out your confidence level in the middle, and then whatever is left, you cut it in half for the two tails. Okay, so for part A, my tail probability is 0 0.025. My degrees of freedom are 12 minus one, which is 11. So if you look at that table, you go down, um, you go over to the 0.025 and go down to the degrees of freedom of 11, and you get a value of 2.20. So your T star value is 2.20, okay? Um, if I take a look at part B, in part B, now I'm looking at a 90% confidence. So here's my normal curve. I got 90% in the middle, which means I've got 10% outside split between the two tails. So then my tail probability is 
So your tail probability is 0 0.05 and your degrees of freedom. In this case, now I've got a random sample of 48 observations. So your degrees of freedom would be 48 minus one, which is 47. Now, if you look at your book, if you look at that table in your book, you don't have a 47 there. Once they get to those high numbers, they start to skip a few. It doesn't make sense to do every single value out. Now we have to err on the side of caution. So we can't round up in this case the lower degrees of freedom account for more tail probability. So we have to err on the side of caution and go lower. If we increase ours, then we've got a lesser degree of freedom and we've, we're gonna get away from our confidence level because we're gonna create a smaller interval and we don't wanna do that, okay? So in this case, when you have 47, you're gonna use the one below it, which in this case is 40. So then that gives you a T star value of, 1.684. Okay, now, like anything else that we have, um, we also have a way that we can use, we can find the T-star value using technology. So if I wanted to do this on my calculator using technology, I'm going to erase my normal curves over here. So again, feel free to back up the video if you need to see those again. But I'm going to give myself a little bit of space to write out my technology directions here. So um, using technology, meaning using your TI-84, okay, um, you're gonna go to second and then distribution, and then you wanna use inverse T. So that inverse T option, if you have the stat wizard, it's gonna give you these, are, these fields to fill in. You're gonna be asked for the area and you're also going to be asked for the degrees of freedom. Now your area is your tail probability. The degrees of freedom is that n minus one, okay? And that's what you would fill in. So in this case, I would, if I look at part B, I would fill in a tail probability of 0 0.05 and degrees of freedom this time of 47. I'm gonna do the n minus one because actually using our calculator here is gonna give us a more accurate T star value. So then when you do the paste and you calculate, you get a T star of, so I'm gonna type that in real quick. So I've got second distribution, I go to inverse T. For me, inverse T is option four. So it might be different for you, but it's option four for me. So 0 0.05, and then my degrees of freedom is 47. I paste that, and I get a T-star of, um, it gives you a negative value here, but we know that we're going to use the positive end of it because we know that those normal curves are symmetrical. So I'm going to use 1.678 there, okay? You can see that it's just slightly different than what we got from the table. It's not a huge difference, but it is enough to make um, to make our T star value more, to make our interval more accurate. Because the table we had to go down to using that value of 40, when really we only needed to go down to 47, um, that's why using your calculator to find the T star is actually going to give you a more accurate value. You can also compare those with this first one because we did use the correct T star or we did use the correct degrees of freedom. So if I do it again, second distribution, I go to inverse T, which is option four. My tail probability would be 0 0.025. My degrees of freedom um, would be 11. And then if I paste that, there's that negative 2.20098, blah, blah, blah. And it carries on. So you get the 2.20 there even with using technology. All right, so let's talk about conditions for estimating mu. Fortunately for us, the conditions are pretty similar to what we did for all of our proportions. We need to state randomness. That's an absolute must, okay? Randomness is crucial for doing any sort of inference of any kind, which is what confidence intervals and tests are. Um, then with sampling without replacement, there it is, 10% condition. So that guy is back because we're looking at confidence intervals. And so we're not pulling people for an experiment. We are looking at an interval based on a larger population. And then normal large counts. So here's how we do normal large counts. We have to do the normal large counts condition to ensure that 
it is appropriate to use a t distribution in the t star value, okay? So we're gonna talk about how normal and large counts is a little bit different. It's not the same as proportions, it's a little bit different. So for normal large counts, okay, random, we already know, this is just our kind of definition box. Random, we already know, we know how to look for if something is picked randomly. 10%, we know what that is. Our sample size has to be less than 10% of the population. That's the same. Both, those are both pretty easy. Large counts actually is a little bit easier for us here. If it's stated that the population is normal, done. Check. You don't need to worry about it. Oftentimes, you don't know that. Oftentimes, you're not told that. So then the next thing you look for is, is your sample size larger than 30? If your sample size is larger than 30, done. Check. Here's the kicker. If the population distribution has an unknown shape and n is less than 30, you can look at a graph of the sample data to assess normality, but do not use t procedures. So that means you cannot construct the confidence interval, nor can you do a significance test. If your graph shows strong skewness or outliers. So check that it's normal. If you're told that it's normal, great. If you're not told that it's normal, is your sample size greater than 30? Then great. If neither of those two things exist, then take a look at a graph. If the graph looks approximately normal, great, move on. If your graph is skewed or has outliers, you're done. You can't do anything else. Okay, so there's our conditions. All right, so let's practice that a little bit. It says determine if the normal large counts condition is met in each of the following settings. So the first one, part A, it says to estimate the average GPA of students at your high school. Um, you randomly select 50 students. Here's a histogram of their GPAs. So when we take a look at that histogram, we want to know does it look um, or does it meet the normal large counts, okay? Well, there was a key phrase in here. Boom. Selecting 50 students. Now, I would say looking at this graph, it kind of appears normal. It has three different peaks, and that's what makes it weird. So it's not totally normal, but it kind of has a peak in the center. But again, all of that doesn't matter because guess what? Yes, large counts is met. because n equals 50, which is greater than or equal to 30. Oops, I didn't mean a comma there, sorry. 30, done. That's it, you're done. So you can move on, great. Let's talk about B. It says, how much force does it take to pull wood apart? The stem plot shows force in pounds and requires, required to pull a piece of Douglas fir apart, Douglas fir apart for each of 20 randomly selected pieces. So this is a stem plot. Now, if you take your iPad and turn it on the side to look at the shape of that graph, the shape of the graph would look kind of like this. Ooh. Okay, now I don't know about you, but that certainly does not look normal to me. I definitely see a skew to the left. I definitely see some outliers up here. The other thing I notice is N is 20. So here's the problem in B, no, Large counts isn't met. Counts. Okay, and then n is equal to 20, which is not greater than or equal to 30. And the graph is skewed left with outliers. So the fact that we're not told it's normal, that was our first check. Um, our sample size is too small, that was our second check. And then our third check is to look at the graph. And in this case, the graph definitely has some skewness to it. And I would even call those bottom two ones outliers. Um, maybe even this 26.5 is an outlier, or 265, sorry, 265. I can read the key. Um, anyway, definitely has outliers, so no. The large counts condition is not met here. Let's look at C. Suppose you want to estimate the mean SAT math score at a large high school. Here's a box plot of the SAT math scores at a random sample of 20 students. Okay, so random sample of 20 students. We're not told that the distribution is normal. So now we're going to have to look at the graph. So if I look at the box and whisker plot, um, 
I would say that yes, this tail is a lot longer than that tail. But all that means is that's a little bit larger range. Now, one thing that I notice is that there are no outliers graphed. So that's good. Okay, so I know there's no outliers. Now, could I, is that enough for me to call it skewed? The fact that the middle 50% is pretty spaced out evenly, your center is there, I don't see a definite skew. It's not an obvious enough skew. So this is one where I would say, yes, our large counts is met. So even though, um, even though our sample size is too small, which is not greater than or equal to 30, um, the graph shows no obvious skew and no outliers. So then this is one where I would say, yeah, it's safe to use t-distribution here. Because again, our t-distribution accounts for a larger tail probability. Um, so we have some wiggle room when things aren't perfectly normal. That's the point of using a t-distribution in the first place. Because we don't know that true standard deviation, we're going to give ourselves a little bit more wiggle room. It's going to widen our intervals a little bit, um, but it gives us a little more grace to construct those intervals given the fact that we don't know if they are truly normal or not. All right, so here's our AP exam tip for today. It says, if a question on the AP exam asks you to construct and interpret a confidence interval, all the conditions should be met. Hey, check that out. If it's going to ask you to construct and interpret a confidence interval, then all the conditions are still should be met. Okay, that's a key for you. So if you get a confidence interval on your, and I believe the same is true for significance tests, if you get that in the free response section of your AP exam, you better find the conditions are met. Now, here's the tip. You're still required to state the conditions and show evidence that they are met. You still have to state it. You still have to state the conditions. You still have to find them. You still have to show that they're met. Um, but you're not going to be given a question in the free response section of the AP exam that asks you to do a confidence interval if the conditions aren't met. Okay, so that's just something to um, keep in mind. So here's the other thing that they say. If you didn't get a graph, then you should include a graph. That means you need to construct a graph, and sometimes that is a case um, if the data is, if the sample size is too small. So if your sample size is less than 30, then you're going to have to make your own graph, unless a graph is given to you. So, all right, there's my AP exam tip for the day. That takes us to the end of the first half of chapter 10.1. Thanks for tuning in, and we will pick up with the second half of chapter 10.1 um, in our next video. Thanks for tuning in.